Hi, I'm Jay Misquick, Director of Aliform Publishing. We're here talking about translation, naming and necessity. And today we're going to take a look at one of the most imprecise but important notions in literature and translation, that is voice. Uh, I'm going to be making a number of references to George Steiner's book, After Babel, Aspects of Language and Translation. Um, I'm not going to be offering any rules about uh, translating voice, but just some kind of general observations about it. I don't know how to define voice, but certainly I know it when I see it. Uh, that's obviously the wrong uh, sense reference there. Voice is what you hear when you read the text. And in that sense, voice is not only determined by the writer and the translator, voice is also very much determined by the reader themselves as they are uh, experiencing the text. This brings us to a crucial notion about voice, whether it is individual or whether it is kind of collective. <clears throat> collective, let us say almost demographic. That is, is there a male voice, a female voice, a black voice, a white voice, a Hispanic voice, an old voice, a young voice, a mega voice, a liberal voice? Let me just give you an example. A number of years ago, I translated a text by Mexican writer Ana Clavel called Shipwrecked Body, Cuerpo Nafrago. And the plot of the story concerns a woman who wakes up one day a man. She is still intellectually, metaphorically, uh, metaphysically a woman, but she now has the physique and the uh, sexual organs of a man. And she takes this disguise, Antonio takes this disguise and enters into some really very masculine realms to look at and analyze and figure out for herself where identity begins. Antonia, now Antonio, speaks in the voice of a man, but precisely what is the voice of a man? Here we have Clavel, a woman writer, writing in the voice of a man, or a woman writing in what a woman thinks is the voice of a man. And I, the translator, a man, now am taking this woman's voice and putting it into a new language. Or I'm taking this woman's voice that's speaking in the voice of a man and putting or what I'm really doing is taking this woman's voice that's speaking in what a woman thinks is the voice of a man and attempting to uh, represent that accurately. Steiner says that the question of translation in its purest form is in what ways can language, which by definition is a shared code of exchange, be regarded as private? To what degree is the verbal expression, the semiotic field, in which an individual functions a unique idiom? And how much does it belong to that collective voice? Every speech form, every symbolic code is open to individual as well as historical and cultural Saul Kripke, in Naming a Necessity, says that we, thus, as part of a community of speakers, have a certain connection between ourselves and a certain kind of understanding. Steiner says, in order to adequately translate a text, a vocabulary, a body of rules and denotative conventions, an area of knowledge of conceptual images, must be mastered. Thomas de Giovanni, the translator of Jorge Luis Borges, the essayist and poet, says that 
his theory of translation is just write good sentences. So part of voice, most of voice, is capturing the original tone. So writing those good sentences, in Giovanni's words, might be actually writing bad sentences, fragmentary, run-on, grammatically incomplete sentences. The translated text shouldn't attempt to be more eloquent and correct than the original, if that's even possible. When I was translating Die, Lady, Die by Argentine writer Alejandro Lopez, I was inside the head of the protagonist, Esperanza, who is the perfect example of train of thought thinking. She is bouncing from one idea to the next without connections, without transitions. She is speaking to herself or speaking to us, the reader, in long, long run-on sentences, in incomplete sentences, in simple words at times. And one review of the translation said that there were parts of it that would have made a fifth grade English teacher cringe. Now, I think in that kind of snarky criticism, there was actually a great deal of truth. That is, the original text is full of what we might call errors or mistakes in Spanish. But that's the way the narration sounds. That's literally the voice of Esperanza. She's not speaking perfectly eloquent Spanish to the reader. She's not making sure that uh, all her I's are dotted and T's crossed. Another aspect of voice that we might consider is what's the direction between languages that the translator should be or can be translated? I have always translated texts from a foreign language, Spanish or French, into my native language of English. But I have a friend, a theater critic and historian, uh, Mikhail Kobialka, who has always translated from his native Polish into English. He sees this transference between languages 180 degrees different than most other translators do, because he believes that understanding the original text, that his understanding of an original text in Polish, all the nuances and historical context, all the puns, uh, etc., which the native speaker might gloss over or might not notice, that that deep understanding of the original text is much more important than any kind of mechanical difficulties that he might have in grammar or syntax or vocabulary as he moves into a second language, as he moves into, for him, a non-native language. Steiner says that the native speaker or reader always has an implicit, immediate understanding of the whole range of associations of a word all those inherited cultural specific connotations that the non-native speaker has to struggle to come to. And so in the process of translation, Steiner says, the inherence of meaning, the compression through context of plural, even contradictory significations into the new language gets lost to a greater or lesser degree. Kobielka presents a great example of his argument in a collection of essays that were written by uh, the Polish theater director, Tajo Kantor, that uh, Kobielka translated and published back in the 1990s. Uh, this range of texts by Kantor comes between, I think, 1944 and about 1990. That is at the end of the Second World War when Kantor is doing some of his most profound work when he's pre presenting Greek tragedies and bombed out buildings uh, literally while war is raging around them. And up to the present day, at least the present day of when those texts were translated, 
all of the deeply layered levels of meaning that are embodied in each of these manifestos and essays by Kant or all the historical, cultural, philosophical, literary, even quotidian references that he makes. All of these paradigmatic expressions that only a Pole would really understand, would really know. All of those puns that are impossible to translate are here understood by the translator. And so perhaps against my own experience and even against my own judgment, I sometimes wonder if the native speaker is the only one who can truly give a native voice to that translated text. An interesting exercise that translators might do is take a text in their own language and attempt to translate it into a second language for them. I've been playing around with this myself, doing some translations of poems by the American poet Mark Statman from uh, English into Spanish. And uh, it's really an interesting exercise and endeavor, and I would strongly encourage people, if not necessarily to try to get something published, but just to experience the idea of voice going into a new language. How can you put your native language, how can you transfer the voice of your native language into a new language? So, what can the translator do or attempt to do to capture the original voice? I think first and foremost, this requires multiple very close readings of the original text. Nothing new when you're doing translation, but you know, let's, let's put metaphor and connotation to one side and style uh, to another side and kind of think about those things differently or think about those things not differently but separately. Uh, a really close attention to style requires attention to syntax, meter, grammar, the repetition of words and phrases the particulars of vocabulary that might help us define or describe that voice. I think we're going to want to make use of really good tools. By tools here, I mean things like reference books in different fields, in science, technology, medicine, engineering, gardening, building trades, uh, having a good set of books that define and describe technical terms for us. So we, so we really have built within those definitions a, a, a group of ideas that we can go to and uh, ponder as we're making these decisions. I also think that dictionaries from a variety of countries helps us here. I have behind me about 150 dictionaries. Uh, many of them are Spanish-English dictionaries, but many of them are as well Spanish dictionaries uh, just of the Spanish language and printed and published in different places in Argentina, in Madrid, in Barcelona, in Lima, in Mexico City. And so if I'm working on an author from a particular country and I have a dictionary of the Spanish language from that country, I think that's also kind of uh, a, a good way of getting at that original voice. Sometimes we might also, if we can learn about it, the actual writing of the text itself might help us achieve a sense of voice. When I was working on a collection of short stories by Eduardo Garcia Aguilar, uh, Urbez Luminosas, uh, Luminous Cities, uh, Garcia Aguilar mentioned to me kind of offhand that he had written all of those stories in one fell swoop. That is, he would return from his work day as a journalist for Agence France Press, and he had an idea to publish a series of short stories that took place in cities around the world based mostly on his own uh, experiences. But he would sit down to write those stories from beginning to end, one draft through, very little revision, 
as they went from that draft into publication. And for me, that was really kind of a revelation in what I wanted those texts to sound like. I think that there was, I wanted that hurriedness to be there. I think I wanted, as Claude Levi-Strauss would say, <clears throat> something a little crude about them, a little raw, a little brute about them. No cleaning up the prose, uh, letting the translation sound rough, letting the translation sound a little bit hurried and incomplete because that's what the author was doing as he was writing it. Certainly, we should also consider the historical and cultural context of both the writer himself or herself and the period in which the text was written. Certainly, the dialogues and the descriptions that uh, Jane Austen writes in Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice sound quite different than the dialogues and descriptions in texts like Slaves of New York by Tama Janowitz or The Summer Without Men by Siri Husvet. Um, writers separated sometimes by only a generation sound quite different. Elena Poniatowska, a very classic, elegant writer, sounds quite different uh, than Anna Clavel does. Carlos Fuentes and Julian Herbert, again, separated by just a generation of writers, sound quite different. A couple of years ago, I wrote a short poem uh, kind of describing how I heard their voices. Fuentes composes Gregorian chants, Herbert traffic accidents. As Ezra Pound said in his great poem, Hugh Selwyn Mauberly, the age demanded an image of its accelerated grimace. And let's keep in mind that the zeitgeist, spirit of the age has its own voice. Of course, the particular text always determines the particular voice. As always, context determines meaning, and voice is a huge part of meaning. And just so, next time we're going to take a look meaning of meaning.